Well, have you guys been blessed this morning? Amen. Amen. You know, I always wonder what it must be like in heaven when God sees his children learning more about him. You know, I can just imagine this whole week, God has just had the biggest grin on his face as he's seen these little kids learn more about his son and about the amazing God he is. Well, this morning we're going to do something a little different. We've been going through the book of Acts, and this morning I need to ask for your forgiveness because I'm going to do the unpardonable sin. Because you see, this morning I'm not going to preach out of Acts, but I'm going to share with you some stories from the barnyard. Because you see, during VBS this week, I got the honor and privilege to tell some stories. So my kids out there, I have to be honest with you, I was farmer pal. So, and if you ask them, what, what happened was, you know, I was, I was Pastor Austin when I had my green shirt on, but when it was story time, I took the green shirt off and I had a farmer shirt on under, and I had a straw hat and I got my text to twang out, and I was farmer pal. <laughs> and you see the kids would come up and be like, oh, you're farmer pal, and I was like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I gotta be honest, I was, I was farmer pal. You guys were right. But you know, it was such an honor and privilege because when do you get an opportunity to tell kids about the most amazing God in the world? Amen. And this morning, I want us to share, I want to share some stories that we went over. So today, we are going to go through four stories that we went over during bi our Bible time together. But before we start, will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray to our amazing God? Oh God of heaven, Lord, how amazing you are. Lord, we praise you for moments like this, for days like this, where we can just spend a whole day with you, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you be with uh, the message today, that you be with our children, Lord, and that, Lord, that you continue to bless and work in marvelous ways. Lord, we love you and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. So this morning, we're going to do something a little different because I have some young ones who are going to help me tell the story. So if you're one of the young ones who are helping me tell the story of the Good Shepherd, will you now stand up and go back like we practice? So if you're doing the story of the Good Shepherd, will you please quietly go back to the back over there and meet Mr. Coates? For the rest of you, will you join me into turning to John chapter 10? Join me in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. <clears throat> And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 18. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. And give me a hearty amen when you get there. Amen. amen. And God's word says this, Very truly I tell you, you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gates for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them about. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, find pasture. The thief, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, and I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the, good, the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them also, that they too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again, not on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. 
The command I receive is from God. Amen. So at this time, I have some VVS kids that are going to help us um, help us understand the story a little more. So if I can get my VVS kids to come on out, please. They'll come on out. <clears throat> oh, perfect, perfect. If you guys will stop right there. All right, will you guys introduce yourselves for us? Tell us what you are. My name's Emma and I'm a sheep. My name's Caitlin and I will be a farm helper. My name's Gianna, I'll be acting out the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. My name is Andrew and I'm gonna be a robber. <laughs> My name is Lucas, I'm gonna be a robber. <laughs> My name is Nadia and I'm gonna be a robber. My name is Junior and I'll be acting out as a sheep. My name is Preference and I'm a wolf. My name is Wyatt, I'm a wolf. My name is Angelina and I'll be acting out a stranger. My name is Ixalia and I will be acting out a stranger. My name is William and I'm gonna be the shepherd. All right. Oh, perfect, perfect. Now let's start the story. So we'll go to our positions. And you see, the story starts like this. Jesus wanted to teach the people who he was. So he told them a story about a shepherd and his sheep. Jesus explained all of the sheep are safe in the pen. And you see, they know who their shepherd is. Their shepherd takes care of them, gives them food, and keeps them safe. When the shepherd comes in the morning, the gatekeeper knows him and lets them into the sheep pen. And the shepherd says, hello, sheep. And the sheep say, ba-ba, hello, shepherd. Ba-ba, hello, shepherd. And the shepherd says, follow me. And they follow him out to green pasture. And when it is nighttime, the shepherd says, good night, sheep. And the sheep say, ba-ba, good night, shepherd. And when it's the morning, the shepherd says, good morning, sheep. And the sheep say, ba-ba, good morning, shepherd. And the shepherd once again says, follow me, and takes them back to the pen. You see, the sheep know their shepherd and recognize his voice. They trust him and follow him and answer him. And the shepherd goes on his way. But Jesus explained that if a thief or a robber comes and climbs over the fence. And as they come over and climb over the fence, and they come and they say to the sheep, come with us. The sheep will say, ba, 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 you're not the shepherd. And they'll just wave and say, ba, 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 ba. ba, ba. So the thieves go back to their den without any sheep. Then let's say a stranger comes and tries to trick the sheep into coming with them. And when the stranger comes into the pen, they say, come with us. Come with us. But you see, the sheep will not go and they'll say, ba, ba, you're not the shepherd. Ba, ba, you're not the shepherd. And once again, they'll wave and say, ba, ba. They'll wave and say, ba, ba. Ba, ba. So the strangers will leave empty handed. See, Jesus explained this, but the people didn't understand, so he told them more. He said, I am the good shepherd. Anyone who comes before me was a thief or a robber, but my sheep didn't follow them. They know my voice. I take care of them. So Jesus told the people to think about this. Let's say a hired farmhand is watching over the sheep. And suddenly, a pack of ferocious wolves come and attack the sheep. Do you know what the farmhand does? She runs away. Because you see, she doesn't care about the sheep, for she is only a hired hand. But the shepherd, the good shepherd comes, and he protects the sheep. Because you see, the good shepherd cares about the sheep. And he loves the sheep. Sheep, because Jesus said that he is the good shepherd 
And he says, I know my sheep, my own know me, and I laid down my life for the sheep. The end. Thank you, guys. And from this lesson, we learn that Jesus cares about us and that he loves us. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read this, when I hear that Jesus is my good shepherd, sometimes it gets lost on me. Because I'll be honest, I was raised in Burleson, and I never raised a sheep. I only know the first thing about sheep raising. Maybe you're an expert, maybe we should talk later. So I did some research so that we could fully understand what a shepherd's job was. And as I was researching, I learned two things. First thing is that a shepherd's job is constant. Because you are always having to watch after the lost sheep. And the second thing I learned is that it's a dangerous job. You know that they not only have to be afraid of wild animals, but also robbers and thieves. And to best explain it, I, I, read, I read a quote from Sir George Adam Smith who was an avid traveler to Palestine and and a writer, and he once pinned on some high moor across which at night the hyenas howl. When you met him, sleepless, far-sighted, weather-beaten, leaning on his staff and looking over the scattered sheep, every one of them on his heart, you understand why the shepherd of Judea sprang to the front of his people's history, why they gave gave their name to their king, and made him the symbol of providence, and why Christ took him as a type of self-sacrifice. And you know, it was interesting. I started to study into, you know, what was the difference between the, Palis- the Palestinian shepherds and other shepherds? And I found some interesting things. For one, did you know that they did not have sheepdogs? So what they would do is, if a sheep started to stray, they would take out their sling, put a rock in it, and they would sling a rock right in front of its nose to be a warning, to give it back on the right path. Another interesting thing I noticed is that the Palestinian shepherds compared to um, British shepherds have a totally different relationship with their sheep. Because you see in Great Britain, the reason they have sheep is primarily to eat, to kill. But in Palestine, they use their sheep primarily for wool. So many times the shepherd would have long relationships with their sheep. They would even go to the point of naming their sheep. And as, as I continue reading, you know in the verse where it says, the sheep know my voice? This is kind of hard for me to understand, so I begin to try to study some more up about it. And H.V. Morton, in his book, In the Steps of the Master, he talks about a really cool eyewitness account. And I'm just going to read it for you here. He says, sometimes the shepherd speaks to them in a loud sing-song voice using a weird language unlike anything I've ever heard in my whole life. The first time I heard heard this sheep and goat language, I was on the hills on the back of Jericho. A goat herdsman had descended into a valley and was mounting the slopes of of an opposite hill. When turning around, he saw that his goats had remained behind to devour a rich patch of scrubs. Lifting his voice, he spoke to his goats in a language that Pan must have spoken on the mountains of Greece. It was uncanny because there was nothing human about it. The words were animal sounds arranged in a kind of order. No sooner had he spoken than an an, uh, than he had spoken on the oh I'm sorry had spoken I'm sorry. Uh, an answering bleat sh- shrivel- shared all over the, the herd, and one or two of the animals turned their heads in his direction, but they did not obey. The goat herdsman then called out one word and gave a laughing kind of whiny sound. Immediately, a goat with a bell around his neck stopped eating and leaving the herd trotted down to the hill across the valley and up to the opposite side of the slope. The man... The man, accompanied by the animal, walked on and disappeared around a ledge of rocks. Very soon, a panic spread among the flock. They forgot to eat. They looked up, and the shepherd and the goat with the bell bell were nowhere to be seen. From a distance came the strange laughing call of the shepherd, and at the sound of it, 
the entire herd stampeded into a hollow and lured up the hill after him. So this is one account of what kind of sounds the shepherd would know. And it's interesting because I continue reading, and the sheep knew distinctly their shepherd's voice. There's another uh, cool account that I found by W.M. Thompson in his book, the Land, of the, the Land of the Book, where he says, the shepherd calls sharply from time to time to remind them of his presence. They know his voice and follow him. But if a stranger calls, the, the sheep will stop short. They will lift up their heads in alarm, and if it is repeated, they will turn to flee. Because they know not the voice of the stranger, and I have made this experiment repeatedly. And here we see the coolest thing, that Jesus is our good shepherd. And you know what's so amazing? Is that he wants to know us intimately. He wants to take care of us. He wants to be there for us. And you know the thing is, he wants us to know his voice. He wants to talk with us. He wants to be with us. And from here we find out one core principle, that Jesus cares. So for our, ne our next story is going to be the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So I have some kids that are going to help, help us experience the story. So can I have my VBS kids come out? Mm -hmm. oh, come on out. Go about right here. All right, come on out. All right, guys, single file line and face the audience. Oh, perfect, perfect. All righty. Yeah, and they're going to help us today with the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. All righty. Now, where'd that microphone go? Will you guys tell us what your name is? Laura, oh. Mia, Ethan, Sage, Caleb, Anya, Adrian, Armando, Franklin, oh. Duvian. Alrighty, and today we're going to do the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Alrighty, and where's my Jesus? Where's my Jesus? There's my Jesus. Alrighty, well one day Jesus said to disciples, let's get away and rest. And the disciples said, sounds good. So they got into the boat. They got into the boat and they begin on their way. They got in the boat and they went on their way. We see as they were on their way, the crowd saw them going and recognized them. And they ran from the towns and cities and got to the place ahead of Jesus and disciples. The crowd said, it's Jesus, let's go. So when the Jesus and the disciples arrived, they looked and they saw the crowd. <gasps> but Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus told the people to sit down. Told the sit people down. to sit down. down. Mm -hmm. And Jesus began to teach the people. He began to teach them by waving his finger. And, and as Jesus was teaching the people, one of his disciples, by the name of Philip, by the name of Philip came up and said, this is a desolate place. This is a desolate place. And it is late in the day. And it is late in the day. The people should go. The people should go. And find something to eat. And find something to eat. Perfect. Because you see, during this time, where they were was in the middle of nowhere. And there wasn't Taco Bell or pizza delivery. <laughs> so Jesus said to Philip, 
Where should we buy some bread? Where should we buy some bread? For these people to eat. These people to eat. Because you see, here's the secret. Jesus was testing Philip because Jesus already knew what he had in mind. So Philip said, even if we had the money. Even if we had the money. From 200 days of work. From 200 days of work. We would only have enough. We would only have enough. For each person. For each person. To get a crumb. To get a crumb. But then Andrew came up and he found a young lady with a lunchbox. Yeah, you found a young lady with a lunchbox. All right. And Andrew went up to Jesus and said, Jesus. Jesus. He said, Jesus, once again. Jesus, once again. <laughs> There's a boy here. There's a boy here. Who has five loaves. Who has five loaves. A barley. A barley. And two fish. And two fish. But that's not enough. But that's not enough. For all these people. For all these people. And you see, the boy gave the basket to Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus had everybody go and sit down. And then Jesus went over there. He went over there. And he lifted up the food and he blessed it. And he said, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bless this bread and fish. Bless this bread and fish. And you know what happened? God did. He multiplied it. And so G Jesus went and got one of his disciples, one of his, his disciples, to go and share the food with everyone. Share the food with everybody. And so Philip and Andrew got up and went and helped them with the, share the food. There you go. And, they, and everybody began to eat and eat and eat and eat. So she went and gave it to everybody. There you go. And everybody began to eat. And they ate and they ate and they ate. Oh, and they ate till their stomach got so full. They were so full and they just kept eating and eating and eating. And it was just so good. And at the end, Jesus had his disciples go and pick up the leftovers, and there were 12 basketfuls. Because you see, Jesus provided the end. And as the kids go back to their seats, I want you to join me. Let's go to John chapter 6. Verse 1 to 14. And you guys may go back to your parents, okay? But be quiet and reverent, please. Mm -mm. And I want us to look at something, because did you notice what kind of bread was used? Barley. And you know what's interesting? Have you guys ever watched the Matthew video? The one where they tell the whole gospel through the book of Matthew. And that's one of my favorite books. But when they get to this story, have you ever seen the bread they use? I mean, this bread is like honking. You know, it's just these, you know, this little kid had five big loaves of bread. But you know what's interesting? Did you know that barley, barley was the lowest grade of, of bread that there is? And in fact, many people said that barley was only for the animals. So when this young boy gave his food to Jesus, this meant that this young boy was very, very poor, very likely. But he gave it to Jesus. And, and when you think about it, it wasn't like he gave him some huge splendid bread that you see in the, you know, the movies where it's these huge loaves. But he gave him his little loaves of barley bread. And you know what's so amazing? That from this little boy giving the little things he has, because even more the fish, was most likely the size of, size of sardines. They make look, little pickled sardines. So really, it's nothing more probably than fish and chips. But you know what's so cool here? This little boy gave his fish and chips to Jesus. And what does he do? 
he multiplies it. And everybody eats until they're full. You know, what's so cool about this is, is no matter what we have, if we give it to Jesus, he can use it. And not only can he use it, but he can multiply it. You know, I once had a friend ask me, you know, we were, we were reading through the book of Acts, and as we were reading through, he's like, man, there's so many miracles. Why don't we see miracles like this today? And if I can be frank with you, you know, I think the reason we don't see that many miracles is because we don't trust in Jesus enough. And we're not willing to give Jesus the little bit we have. Because as you read it, can you imagine, there was 5,000 men, all right? And if each, and each of these men had one wife, then you times that by two, and you got 10,000, right? Can you imagine with 10,000 people or 5,000 people, not one of them having one piece of bread or one piece of food? And 5,000 people. But you see, it was only the little boy who was willing to give his food to Jesus. And in the same thing, we should trust Jesus enough to give all we have, as little as it might be, to him. And watch as he multiplies and, <clears throat> and multiplies and works miracles through our lives. So the next group, I need my people that are going to help me with the parable of the sower. If you guys could stand up and come to the back. And the rest of you, will you join me in reading Matthew chapter 13? Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to read verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. And when you get to Matthew chapter 13, will you give me a hearty amen? Amen. 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 And this is one of my favorite parables. It says, That same day Jesus went out to the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd had gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky paths, where it did not have much soil. It sprained up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And now I'd like us to skip down to verse 18 to 23. It says, listen then, and this is verse 18 of chapter 13, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one come and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown among the path. The seed fallen on rocky grounds refer to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed fallen among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And at this time, can I have my VBS kids come out to help me? All right. Perfect, perfect. Perfect, perfect. And will you guys stand up and introduce yourselves? My name is Alyssa. My name is Randon. My name is Caitlin. My name is Ricky. My name is DJ. 
My name is Aiden. My name is Isaac. My name is Mia. My name is Billy. And my name is Danny. Oh, perfect. And the story goes like this. Jesus wanted to tell the people a story about how God's word is spread. So one day there was a sower. And the sower went out and he threw some seeds out onto the path. And the seeds fell onto the path. But before they could grow, an, a hungry bird came and ate them up. And the seeds were in her belly and the bird flew away. But the sower continued to sow. And as he sowed, he went to a rocky path and threw some seeds on there. And the seeds, once they were on the rocky path, began to grow and grow and grow. And as they were growing, the sun came out and spread her marvelous rays. And it scorched the plants until they withered and died. But the sower continued on his way. And he threw some seeds into a thorny path. And the, the seeds begin to grow and grow and grow and begin to get stronger and stronger and stronger. But what the seeds didn't know is that at the same time they were growing, so were the weeds. And the weeds began to choke and to strangle them, and they died. But the sower continued on his way, and he came to some good so soil and sowed some seeds. And these seeds begin to grow and grow and grow and grow and get stronger and stronger and stronger. But you know what? These seeds begin to multiply and more and more plants continue to grow and grow and grow 160 and 30 fold until the good soil was full of good plants. Amen. The end. And our lesson there is we learn that God leads. That God leads us into his word. And the question we have is, as we look at this parable is, what kind of soil are we? That's probably a weird question to ever ask yourself. I don't know if you ever looked in the mirror and said, what kind of soil am I? <laughs> I know I haven't. But you know, we had the path. And the path are those who are, who are close-minded to the word. You know, they hear it, it comes in one ear and comes out the other. You know, and then there's the, the stony path, which are those who, are, who emotionally accept it. They're quick to accept it, and they're like, yes, 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 but they never take time to study it for themselves. So when persecution comes, when people start to ask them about their faith, they're quick to fall away. And then we have the thorny ground, or the thorny path, and that's, that's the ground where they grow, 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 and they're strong, but they're never able to produce fruit. And the reason why is because the worries and the things of this world distract them so much that they, they forget to produce fruit. But then we have the good soil. And the good soil is, I don't know about you, but I want to be good soil. So maybe when we get home and we look in the mirror, we should be like, I am good soil. Or maybe when we pray, we say, God, I want to be good soil. You know what? For good soil, there's a few attributes. One, they're open-minded. So when God talks to them, they're willing to accept it. They're ready to listen, and not only to listen, but to understand. Because it's one thing to listen to someone, but it's another thing to understand them, right? I mean, you can have a whole conversation with someone, but if it's going in one ear and out the other, was it beneficial? No. And not only that, but the good soil is not only ready to listen, ready to understand, but they're ready to translate those words into actions. To be good soil, we must produce fruits. And that is what God is calling us to do. And so finally, we have one last story. And can my group come up to, that's going to help me? Or my one last story. And we're going to do the story of the prodigal son, which is found in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. So if you guys will join me in turning to there, to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Verses 11 to 32. And as they're getting ready, we'll read it together. And as again, that's Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. And it says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one was said 
to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered all his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways away, his father saw him and, and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer am worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring, put a ring on his finger and a sandal on his shoe. Bring the fatting calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard a voice. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed him, the fattened calf because he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father and said, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you, never disobeying your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because a brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Now my VBS kids, will you come out? Those of you who are going to help me tell the story. Perfect. And today we're going to kind of change up the story a little bit. It's going to be the story of the prodigal daughter. All right, so please forgive me for, for switching it up on you, but will, will you all introduce yourselves? I'm Angelina, and I'm going to be a friend. I'm Ashley, and I'm going to be a friend. I'm Abby, and I'm going to be the farmer. I'm Isabel, and I'm going to be the younger daughter. I'm Arlene, and I'm going to be the older daughter. I'm Danny, I'm and I'm going to be the dad. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so the story goes like this. Jesus told a parable, a teaching story about forgiveness. There was a man who had two sons. He loved both sons. They all worked on the farm. But one day, the young, oh, the younger daughter, I'm sorry, I said sons. The younger daughter got tired of working, and she threw down her hoe and stomped over to her father. And she said, Dad, Dad, I'm sick of this hard work. I'm sick of this hard work. I'm ready to get out of here and have some fun. I'm ready to get out of here and have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my part of the family's money. Give me part of that family's money. The father was sad, but he didn't argue and gave her the money. And the daughter said, hee hee hoo hoo. <laughs> and she went on her way. And she went to a distant town and made some friends. And they began to party. They put their right hand in. They put their right hand out. They put their right hand in. And they shaked it all about. And just like that, all her money was gone. And her friends said bye-bye and left her. So during this time, not only did she not have any money, but a famine came, and she became really, really hungry. 
So she came and found a farmer and said, can you give me a job? You give me a job. And, and she said, sure, I have some pigs. Sure, I have some pigs. So the daughter began to feed the pigs. And as she was feeding the pigs, the food looked so good that she was tempted to take a bite. And just as she was about to take the bite, she said, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Of starvation. Of starvation. But my father's farmhands farm have plenty to eat. Have plenty to eat. So I'm going to go back and ask to become one of my, farmer's farm, one of my father's farmhands. So I'm going to ask to go to my father's farm. So she got up and she decided to go to her father and as she was halfway there, her father saw her coming and ran to meet her and he gave her a big pound it. <laughs> and, the and the daughter said, Father, I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be your daughter. Can I have a job? But the father said, Quick, bring my best things for her to wear. Let's make a big southern dinner. Let's make a big southern dinner. Turn on some Christian music. Turn on some Christian music. And let's celebrate. And let's celebrate. My, my daughter has come home. My daughter has come home. So they all begin to have a celebration. They were so glad to see her back. But you see the older bro, bro, uh, the older daughter, sorry about that. The older daughter heard all the commotion and she asked what was happening and she found out that it was a celebration for her younger daughter, or younger sister. So the father noticed that his, his daughter wasn't there, so he came out looking for her. The father came out looking for his, young, his older daughter. And the daughter said, look, father, all these years, I never disobeyed you. You never gave me a party. But this crazy daughter of yours, who wasted all your money. She gets one? No fair. But the father answered, I am all, I, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. We have to celebrate. Your brother who was lost has been found. Uh, oh, the end. <laughs> I just want to thank, thank you all, of, all my VBS kids. You helped me with the stories. You guys were marvelous. Did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. Oh, I enjoyed that. And you know, just to close, I want us just to focus on this last story because this is one of my favorite stories because you see here that there were actually two la lost daughters or sons, right? There was one who was lost in the world and there was one who was lost in the father's service and didn't even know it. But you know the marvelous thing for both of them? Is that we have a God in heaven that no matter what we've done, no matter where we are in life, is there with outstretched arms wanting us to come back home. So as we leave, I just want to, I just want to invite you, if you have been running away from God, or maybe you, you've ran away from God and you know that God's calling you back, what are you waiting for? It's time to go back home. But if you can relate with the older brother, who, you know, you've been in the service of the, f of the Father, but maybe you become a little cold. You know, maybe you've gotten to that lukewarm rut and you're just looking for a meaning. I'd like to invite you to come back to God. Let Him renew that love for Him in your heart. And you know, to close, I just want to challenge each and every one of you this Sabbath to spend some time with God. And I mean, let's do something crazy, like go for a walk. I mean, we're going on a hike today at 3. So go on a hike and just enjoy God's nature. You know, your kids know how to do it, so maybe you should act out some Bible stories with them. But even more, what if we actually, what if you actually read a whole book of the Bible? I'm saying a whole book. Like you just sat down and you read a whole gospel. And if a gospel is too much, maybe you just read, you know, like James or 1 John, a little book. But what if you took a moment in God's word? And the last thing I want to challenge you to do is, I want to challenge you today to talk to God. And I'm not just talking about going over those pre-rehearsed lines that we always say, but truly take some time to be like, God, this is what's on my heart. I need you. I want to be with you. And just spend some time 
with our Lord in heaven who loves us and cares for us. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord our God, God this morning, we found out that your Son is our Good Shepherd who watches and takes care of us. But Lord, we also learned that you are a God that forgives and that Lord, you love us so much. And today, Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us learn what a life-changing relationship with you is all about. Lord, may we draw close to you today and may our lives forever be changed. In your name I pray, amen.